Hello. Hello. What's up? What, okay, what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? A puzzle? What are you yeah. doing? Okay, well, it's, pieces. it's it's not puzzle time. It's podcast. Time. Oh, is that right now? Okay, That's I'll get on right now. Bye. Okay, all right. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Oh, good. yeah. What's going on? I'm ready. A UFOologist. I don't even think I've ever even heard of something like that before. But there's so many questions that I really want to ask because who are they? Where are they? What are they? And, and how do things like E.T., who came up with that look? Why do they look like that? It's our idea of what it could look like. But I want to just show you, there is somebody right now. Where do you think he came from? Anybody have any ideas? Do we think that he might be an alien creature from somewhere else? I mean, does this constitute a somebody from another planet? First of all, let me ask you something. He's a UFOologist. It doesn't even sound like it sounds like a urologist, a UFOologist, UFOologist. UFOlogist? I, I don't know. I think uh, I'm not sure that's an official title or anything. There he is. Hello. Hi, Nick. How are you? Hi. Great. Thank you. I'm Jesse, and that's Priscilla. Good to meet you all. Nice virtually. to meet you too. Yes. <laughs> how we were just talking about how would you title yourself? Well, I guess I'd just say retired government official. And I suppose, although I did a lot of things in my 21 years working at the Ministry of Defense in the UK, I'm best known for having run their UFO program. Now, when you were running the UFO program, program Nick, is, was it, did you see things while you were in there that the public was unaware of? Yes, I had access to all the information coming in. Now, some of it, of course, came from the public themselves, mm -hmm. but some of it was from our own people. So pilots, radar operators, the sort of thing that we're beginning to see now in the United States, of course, with the declassification and release of those three videos of U.S. Mm -hmm. Navy jets chasing UFOs. Well, that was kind of the equivalent of the work I was doing in the U.K., what did you think when you saw those those videos? Because they're pretty remarkable in a way. It's hard to know what to make of them. Part of me was thinking it's not a big deal because I know that sounds crazy, but but obviously people that have done it from within government, we know that pilots see these things all the time. Mm -hmm. What did surprise me was the fact that ultimately, of course, the, the Pentagon itself put those videos out there. They leaked to start with, but... The DOD took ownership, put it out, did a press release even, and said, yeah, these three videos are real, and they're still unidentified. I mean, what do, you, what do you make of that, that these things are unidentified? And you must have seen every kind of unidentified thing. Most of them, most of them I imagine, are sort of fake, but, but the ones that you see that you really wonder about, what do you, what do you, think, they, what do you think it is? Well, I don't know. It's a little bit scary, actually, that there's something in our airspace and even, you know, the United Kingdom, when I was doing the job, the United States now, the full power and might of the state with all its resources and capabilities, whether it's, it's the, you know, billion dollar aircraft carrier and, and the Navy group, uh, the jets, the pilots themselves, of course, the radar operators, all that configured on on these three videos well more than three i mean you know there's not just three of these things but mm -hmm. three we've seen the public have seen and they still can't figure it out that's worrying and people are asking is this russia is this china or is it from somewhere a little bit further away and i don't know you know um the aircraft carrier that that saw the ufos i think on three consecutive days from different planes having different radars do you know the one i'm talking about Yes. I mean, the, there's the Tic Tac incident uh, mm -hmm. from 2004. Then there was another incident from 2015. Uh, those are the ones we've seen videos from. But of course, the, the government, the military has a whole bunch of these encounters. And that's why the Navy said last year, we're even issuing guidance to our people, telling them what to do if they, they come across these things. What did they? What what happened in the TikTok video? The TikTok video because I don't think Priscilla has seen that one. 
Well, essentially, it, uh, all three of these videos arguably just show U.S. Navy jets chasing, literally, UFOs, or UAP, as we call them in government, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And you can hear what's great about these videos is that you can't, it, it's not just watching them on forward-looking infrared video, but you can hear the pilots talking to each other. And these top guns, you know, they're not easily impressed. And, and they're kind of shouting and, and saying, look at that thing, look at it go. And when those top guns get excited like, like that, in terms of the speed and maneuverability that they're dealing with, obviously, uh, you know, it gives one pause for thought. They also yeah. saw a ship underneath the water, yeah? Yes, that's one of the most interesting things of all. They said it was almost as if something was down there churning up the water like a submarine, but not a submarine. I mean, obviously, we know where our subs are, and without wanting to go into too much detail, we probably know where everyone else's are too. So for people just listening, that is an, you know, a really extraordinary thing that, A, the government works on this. So from your point of view, you know, have you always been interested? Are you a believer? What, what is this? Where, who, what, is, what do you think is going on when you, you know, are seeing all this work? Well, I had no interest or belief in this subject whatsoever until as a serving civilian employee of the Ministry of Defense, back in 1991, a particular job vacancy came up at the exact same time as I was due for a move. And the personnel department basically said, how would you like this job? And I said, what's the job? And they said, UFOs. And, <laughs> so, and, and of course, as I now know, governments all around the world have programs looking at this. Some are more open about it than others. Some, of course, are free, open, democratic societies with Freedom of Information Acts, others not so much. But I was lucky enough to be put into this job. And like I say, I had no interest or belief. Um, and then I did this amazing tour of duty. And I was like, you know, sure, 95% of it is aircraft lights and weather balloons and satellites. But every now and then we have something like the Tic Tac incident, say, and we've had our equivalent in the UK. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? I thought this was all just nonsense. And now I find that our own pilots are, are seeing them and chasing them and we're tracking them on radar. And th this is kind of really bizarre. Have you ever talked to any of the pilots yourself? I've, I have not talked to any of the Tic Tac incident pilots. I have spoken to many, many, uh, both military and uh, commercial airline pilots in the UK and some in the US too. Um, but obviously I was not involved in this Pentagon program, which was known as ATIP, Advanced um, uh, advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. They try not to mention anything about UFOs in the title, kind of throw people off a little. Uh, so I haven't spoken to those pilots, but, but I've probably over the years spoken, I would think, to, to like maybe over 100 different military and commercial airline pilots who've seen these things. And that's interesting because even to those of us in government, they're a little bit reluctant to come forward and speak out. It's still... Maybe things are changing now this subject is coming out of the fringe and into the mainstream, but there's still the perception that it's not maybe the most career enhancing thing to do to talk about this. But why? That's the question. Like, why are we afraid? Why, why is it a weird thing to talk about? Why would there be a stigma? It's still because of this wretched pop culture baggage that the term UFO has from, I mean, look, I'm a sci-fi fan, but science fiction and, and this subject don't really mix. And particularly with the media, the sections of the media still love to ridicule this. People roll their eyes, play, play silly music and have funny light effects. Even when the story is deadly serious, like, like government, military, radar, all that, intelligence community personnel. Now the Senate Intelligence Committee even has asked for a report on all this, but we still can't escape that baggage. And you know, that's one reason why back in the 90s, 
we in the Ministry of Defence, I mentioned this earlier, the, the phrase UAP, we changed UA, UFO to UAP precisely to try and get rid of this stigma. But it's still there slightly. It's changing, thank goodness. But what does pop culture do to it? So, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, movies that we see or, you know, what, what is pop, how has pop culture changed it or shaped our, uh, you know, impressions of, of what we might think? Because I was literally just referencing all the TV shows and movies, right, that deal with this. Yeah, I, I think the biggest single problem is almost that some people see a UFO story and then, I, I mean, a serious one on the news, and then they almost think like, well, this is just like something in the X-Files, shouldn't really take this seriously, it's a bit of fun. Well, not to the, the intelligence community personnel who are trying to figure this out, it isn't. To them, it's their job, but that's not necessarily the way the public sees it. So Nick, do you think that there's life on other planets? Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, you, I, it's a cliche, but you throw the dice enough times and, and the same numbers come up and, and in an infinite universe. And look, of course, literally just what now, two, two weeks ago, we had this announcement about the possible detection of evidence suggesting there's microbial life on Venus. Well, if you have not one, but two, maybe three, if, if you think there's life on Mars, as many do, um, instances of life arising just in our one solar system. Well, I'm lowballing these figures, by the way, but there's about 100 billion stars in our one Milky Way galaxy, maybe 100 billion galaxies in the universe. If there's, if there's two instances of life just in our solar system, then logically, life no longer becomes this sort of cosmic miracle or accident, but it becomes just something that arises naturally. And, and therefore, the extrapolating, the universe should be teeming with life. And then we can have a debate about like the drive to complexity, the evolutionary advantage of intelligence. But again, the logical supposition must be, there's other life out there. And some of it's probably intelligent. And in a universe nearly 14 billion years old, there might be civilizations out there with a head start of a billion years over us. And what might they be like in terms of their understanding of science and their development of technology? It would certainly, um, if that proved to be true, it would certainly change our, our belief systems about religion, you know, different things, how we would find ourselves in this universe. You know, have you thought about that? Very much so. And uh, in about 10 years ago, the Royal Society back in the UK had two discussion meetings to discuss exactly those sorts of issues. And you're right, there's, there's no part of our lives and our society that won't be touched by this, both individually and at a societal level, politics, religion, economics, science, technology, personal philosophy and worldview, everything will be impacted in one way or the other by the realization that it's not just us. And particularly if we're talking about not just microbes, but other civilizations, maybe even visiting. Do you yeah. think it always has to be contentious though? Like, are we always gonna take a posture, human beings on this earth right now, the creatures that we are, the aliens that we are, it always has to be a defensive posture. Do we, you know, and why are we so, like, again, you've got government and DARPA and all of these kind of what we know, very serious protection organizations, as opposed to, you know, like the humane society, like, why is it, why do we have to take the posture that it's something nefarious? Or are there other organizations that don't take that, you know, point of view? Well, I, I think that's a really interesting point. The the polarization is, I, I think we could all probably say, something that we see a lot in, in everyday society, whether it's, it's politics or religion or whatever it is. And there's no getting away from the fact that with UFOs too, sure, you get this, the evil aliens are coming to invade us or wipe us out. But you do get, to answer your question, you do get people who take a, I, I don't want to say, well, maybe I will, a sort of more uh, spiritual, new age, take on this, the space brothers, the space sisters are coming to share their knowledge, 
galactic federation, maybe this uh, is something that could unite us as, as a people, even without wanting to get into the politics of it. It's not a party political issue, but even many years ago, Ronald Reagan said at the United Nations Security Council, I occasionally think how quickly we would set aside our differences if we faced some alien threat from beyond this earth. And um, again, there is no denying that when you hear the Tic Tac story, for example, I mean, firstly, it involves the military, but secondly, you've got people talking up, maybe the threat narrative. But I understand that. It's the only way you'll get congressional action on this, which is, is what myself and, and a number of people want on this. We want politicians of all persuasion to at least take this seriously. And you won't get it seriously without highlighting the potential threat side of this. So it's a little bit of a tactic in, in some cases, but it is there, it's, it's there. And, mm. and obviously I go back to that point, a, a civilization with a billion year head start on us. I, I mean, that tech would be a little bit worrying if they didn't have our best interests in, in mind. Nick, will you just tell us the Tic Tac um, story just a little bit so that people know? Sure. Back in 2004, the USS Nimitz, the aircraft carrier, was, was uh, operating off the west coast of the United States with a, a large US Navy task force. And um, over several different days, in multiple encounters, with firstly uncorrelated targets on the radar system took place, but also um, f pilots filming these things on forward looking infrared camera and having visual sightings as well. So of course, skeptics say, and, and rightly so, well, you know, you can have gl glitches in the radar or you can have pilots misidentifying things visually, or you could have the forward-looking infrared cameras playing up. Sure, all of that happens, but when over multiple days, multiple systems, including the good old-fashioned Mark I eyeball, see these things, uh, then it tells you there's something there. And look, the other thing about all this is that if, if the US government, if we were just dealing with, with a radar glitch, I think with all the resources and capabilities and expertise, the government would have figured it out by now. And yet the position both privately to the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee and in public uh, on, on the DOD website is we genuinely don't know. These things remain unidentified. Now, Nick, what were they doing? Because the speeds they were moving, the, the their ability to to, to move fast and then to stop and change direction? You know, what were some of the things we saw and what were they shaped like? Well, they were, I mean, I mean you know, it sounds almost comical, but this, this tic-tac shape, this oval shape. And uh, one of the witnesses does recall seeing some sort of, almost like an appendage on this thing. And the other thing that it could do going back to your, your point about its, its maneuvering and what it was doing is a really interesting thing. It, it, it had this, the technical term used is, is transmedium travel. It, it seemed to be effortlessly able to operate either in the water or out of the water in, in the air. And this is the really bizarre thing on at least one occasion, it almost seemed to anticipate the action of the pilots and where the pilots would fly. Because as they tried to reacquire the object and vector onto it for an intercept, when they got there, it was already there. Well, I mean, what's going on with something like that? Is it, is it just very fast acceleration and speed? Or is it somehow aware of what people are going to do before they do it? I mean, these are, these are almost staggeringly impossible, almost philosophical questions sometimes. Do they want, I mean, have we ever seen anything like that since then? Have there been recordings up to that extreme? Well, the, the US government, the military, the intelligence community is being very cagey about this. They have 
obviously released these three videos because they were almost painted into a corner on that. They had leaked. Um, what they have subsequently said is that there is an ongoing series of unauthorized incursions into uh, restricted airspace around military installations, around areas in which the US is operating. Uh, I mentioned earlier that they'd issued guidance to their pilots, some of the other people, um, but they, what they have not done is say precisely how many of these incidents there have been, and they've not released any more videos, which is why the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, along with the Armed Services Committee, but the Intelligence Committee is taking the lead, has asked for a full report on this, and they put this into the Intelligence Appropriation Act for fiscal year 2021. And of course, the, the interesting thing is some of the people who sit on the Intelligence Committee uh, in, include Marco Rubio, who's the acting chair, and uh, Kamala Harris, of, of course. So, I mean, this is, this is, as I say, it's not a party political issue, but there are some fairly big guns on the Intelligence Committee. And uh, as I say, they have demanded from the Director of National Intelligence in consultation with the Secretary of Defense and others as appropriate, they've demanded a report on this. So, Nick, you know, we, we have a lot of trouble communicating with, a, uh, with an octopus, which is, from all accounts, fairly intelligent. Um, uh, you know, do you think that we'll have, you know, it, people say it, an octopus might have evolved from someplace else. Like there's a theory that it might actually be an alien in and of, of itself. Do you think that when aliens do come here, we will have the ability um, to communicate with them? And, you know, if they... I mean, just thinking about it, if they came from a different place, the way they may have evolved would be different depending on the gravity, their distance from their sun, the, the temperatures, all those things. They may not look anything like us. You know, we may be, there may be life teeming out there, but what form might, it might take is, is a, a question. Well, I think to answer your second question first, absolutely. I think, um, again, in an infinite universe, we'll see a huge diversity of life. And one of the interesting things, um, this has maybe gone on the back burner a little bit with all this recent talk of microbial life on Venus, but let's not forget machine intelligence may be uh, something. And again, back at that one of the two Royal Society discussion meetings I mentioned, a former uh, chief historian of NASA, Stephen Dick, made the staggering assertion that we may be living in a, a largely post-biological universe populated largely by, as he put it, immortal thinking machines. Again, these are, these are uh, you know, almost impossible concepts for us to get our, our heads around. But um, th there well, that, are- that's The core of that is what is life? You know, what, what constitutes life? Exactly, and, and would we even be able to perceive it at all? Would we perceive it as life? To probably misquote Star Trek, it's life, but not as we know it. Uh, to take your first point, though, about communication, I don't want to, I, earlier on, I was almost criticizing sci-fi, but don't get me wrong, I love sci-fi. Two of the best movies, I think, uh, sci-fi movies, are about, fundamentally, one of the key issues in these both these movies is about how would we communicate and it's arrival and contact. And there's some fairly good science behind that in terms of things like mathematics being the universal language of the universe. Pi, for example, the value of pi would be something you could e immediately put out as a, a signal to signal that you understand, you, you are intelligent, you understand mathematical concepts and you can build on something like that. There are some scientists, some academics who are working on precisely this question and, and people in the SETI Institute, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, have, have a sort of post-detection task group who are working on this. People like John Elliott at Leeds University are working on it, a number of others. You know, in Arrival, uh, one of the things that the alien, it postulates is that the aliens understand time in a different way. And here on this planet, we know that 
a turtle thinks about time very differently than the way we think about time. So is, does time play a factor in the way you think aliens would present themselves? Is that what the TikTok event is, is telling us because the things can move so fast, they understand things that we don't? Well, I think there is at least one um, theoretical, physic, uh, theoretical physicist, Jack Sarfati, who, who has talked about time travel in relation to the Tic Tac incident. Uh, there are some other scientists working on, on theoretical physics of time travel, people like Professor Ronald Mallet, uh, but, but there are others. And one of the interesting things, I don't profess, I'm not a scientist myself, so I'll probably mangle all this, but one of the things one hears is the idea that, to, as we saw in Arrival, um, to some life forms and, and maybe in some ways of looking at time, it's not perhaps the linear way that we think of it, uh, the arrow of time going irrevocably one way from past to future. And the idea, the almost philosophical idea as time as a river where, where you could maybe dip into parts of it simultaneously, whether it's, it's present, future, or past. I, I don't profess to understand the physics of it, but absolutely, who knows? So do, have you, in your travels on these subjects, have you talked to people who've actually say that they've met an alien? Yes, I have. Uh, now I've come across some people who claim telepathic contact with extraterrestrials who, who basically say that they channel these entities and some people who literally say that they have been taken against their will on, on to a, a, a spaceship. I mean, we, we saw, I suppose, authors like Whitley Strieber, um, who, who was famous as a fiction author long before he came forward and said, no, I believe these experiences are happening to me in real life. And then there were researchers like uh, Professor John Mack at Harvard Medical School, uh, Bud Hopkins, Dave Jacobs, a number of other people, Barbara Lamb, Yvonne Smith, um, many, many people researching this, hundreds if not thousands of people who say, that they've been taken. I don't know what to make of, of these people, um, but one interesting, I suppose, bridge between those sorts of accounts, which you, a lot of people say, well, that's just crazy stuff. But when it was revealed that the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency and then, then the Department of Defense took it over, had this program called ATIP, um, the DIA wrote to Congress and said, here are 38 scientific and technical studies that we've been doing uh, on, under the ATIP contract. And one of them was about the physiological effects of this phenomenon, whatever we're dealing with, on close encounter witnesses. Now, it's largely talking about things like radiation, but... I, I suspect that although they had to be careful not to be perceived as, as going too far in, into the fringe, that they clearly looked at people who claim to have these sorts of experiences. Now, to, to paraphrase the physicist Michio Kaku, we won't prove any of this until one of these people steals something off of a ship and brings it back to a lab and, and tests it. But... But joking aside, that's, that's the sort of thing we'd need. And of course, there are people who say there is maybe not artifacts, but wreckage and debris out there. A number of people associated with these sorts of programs say, yes, this stuff exists. And, and of course, that means we can test it. They did um, find please. studies where people who have these experiences, they didn't know what the other person was saying. You know, they would keep it separate. And were there other commonalities of, of that experience that you've taken that you can recall or share with us? There have been very few, I, I, I think literally scientific, double blind, peered review uh, studies into this. In fact, I'm not sure there've been any that would fall into that category. What I know that um, uh, the late Bud Hopkins was doing and it's, it's similar to what a researcher called, I think, Peter Fenwick is doing 
uh, in relation to near-death experiences was um, taking uh, data about um, symbols that these people recalled seeing on board craft and then not making that public and then using that as a control to see if the same thing would come up independently among people who you know have had no con collusion but i suppose the the question then becomes how could you be certain that those people genuinely had no collusion uh, but Although those are the sorts of things i mean that's very difficult only because i think there's a perceived idea of what being taken means so so it's hard to sort out whether it's true or it's not true because we've seen movies about it we have a collective understanding of it as one kind of idea um uh what's your thought about that you know we have people seeing ufos all over the world we see in russia we have the triangles you know we have a we have a lot of people seeing a lot of different stuff but most of them turn out to be hoaxes and fakes in some sense or, a, or another what's your feeling about that it's an extraordinarily difficult problem in this field because as you say if, if you get a lot of reports and uh say all, all the good ones look similar does it mean that simply these these people have been colluding or that there's been cultural contamination i mean this this image of of the alien gray with this huge disproportionately large head almond shaped eyes is so firmly embedded now in our culture and our awareness that if somebody says that's what i saw you know the skeptics might say well you've you've simply seen that image in in books in movies in magazines so does it mean that there's been this this contamination or does it mean no that's what they look like and and there's building on that point there is this cultural expectation that sometimes we see what we want to see uh what what we expect to see and that brings you to the question of the different cultural backgrounds and belief systems of this and to quote one example i mean you know if you see if you wake up in the middle of the night and you see a shadowy figure at the foot of your bed if you were religious you you might think you were seeing an angel or a demon or or the the virgin mary some sort of apparition if you were uh, interested in paranormal research you might think you're seeing a ghost and if you're into ufology you might think you know help i'm being abducted by aliens who's to say that we're not dealing with the same core phenomenon but perceived and interpreted through the lens of our different culture belief even our language the 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 way we express ourselves how do we get to um how do we get to the almond shape eye like how does that evolve you know a did it start from books and and how far back are the records you know in terms of what what how far back does science fiction actually go you know and and how where do those ideas come from well i think that um ideas of there being other worlds go back almost to the dawn dawn of time i mean now you know without getting into a a, a sort of religious debate and things but you you could say that humanity has always placed its gods in the sky and either salvation or damnation and destruction which, whichever uh, or both come from above and and one person's god is another person's alien uh angels demons gods devils uh, all all perhaps blur into one but um again on on the question the idea i mean we even have the phrase in in science fiction and and particularly pulp sci-fi and the crossover with with horror um the bug-eyed monster for example then we have the the idea that the eyes are the window to the soul and certainly in the 50s and the 60s we saw images maybe a little further back than that of aliens with large eyes but uh, the the almond shaped eyes that that came really in the 80s um and it it came with the work of researchers like Bud Hopkins and then it was popularized on the front cover of Whitley Strieber's book communion uh subsequently made 
made into a, a, a movie, um, of, of course. So uh, now that idea is everywhere and that image is everywhere. You can see it on, on coffee mugs and t-shirts and everywhere. So Nick, you, you've talked about um, a skeptic's perspective. Where, where are you on the line of skeptics or not skeptics? Do you believe that, that this exists, you know, aliens exist and they're here now walking among us? Like what's your personal belief? Life out there, um, count me in, uh, count me in the camp of the believers. Life visiting us down here, um, I'm undecided. I'm, I, but I think I'd, I'd like it to be true. As I sometimes say, the world would be a more interesting place with aliens in it than not. And um, I, it would be, as we discussed earlier, the ultimate game changer in so many ways. So, yeah. and, and one of my other favorite phrases on all of this, when, when we're talking about alien visitation is that the, the skeptics have to be right every day and the believers only need to be right once with any right. of this. Um, you know, if we do live in such a particularly polarizing time, if we had an alien come down here and land in the middle of Trafalgar Square, might it, might it pull society together in some sense? It might, and I think we go back to Ronald Reagan's quote about that, but I'm, I'm tempted to say, and then 10 minutes later, we forgot about all that and started arguing among ourselves again. Oh, so oh. I, I suspect that there's something about um, nationalism, tribalism, whatever you call it, um, that's hardwired into us as, as humans. And I suspect that we'll always find something to argue over. So even, yeah, there, there may be a temper. I mean, you, the, the classic example is warfare. How sometimes in history, um, perhaps unlikely alliances come together to unite against a common foe. But sadly, what we find is that after the defeat of that foe, those alliances very quickly break up and people start squabbling and, and indeed fighting again. So I don't know. I sometimes think that the most intriguing thing about all this is not so much, are they going to be good? Are they going to be evil? Are they going to be this or that? Um, but are there concepts that not only have we not thought of, but that our brains are just not configured that we could even conceive of, of some of these concepts. And the Astronomer Royal in the UK once said in relation to extraterrestrial life, that it may be so beyond our ability to understand that it would be like trying to explain quantum physics to chimpanzees. So whether it's gender or whether it's other things, reproductive strategies, um, good versus evil, um, you know, maybe there are different ways that the universe will, will do the whole life thing. Tremendous, so Nick. Much. Nick, this yeah. is incredible to talk with you, have this opportunity to talk with you. And please, for your sake, I hope you get to have an experience that, you know, whatever that is, to keep us all, you know, wanting and believing, because there's something yeah. About the possibility. Take this away from. Me. Yeah, thank you so much for spending time with us, Nick. I really appreciate it. It was really wonderful. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this chat, and I think we really covered a wide range of, yeah. of fascinating subjects that I don't often get into in these interviews. So thank you. The turtle thinks about time. What about it? What? How do you know that the turtle thinks about time? Well, the turtle does think about time differently because you can move her. What? How do you know what the turtle is thinking? That's what you take out of this interview, the thing about the turtle? No, no, no. I mean, we were out into the most, one of the most unbelievable conversations probably will ever witness. And, Wait, I, we, and you came back to the turtle? I want to ask you about the turtle because I was just like, where did the turtles? Well, turtles think about time differently. They live a lot longer than us and, and they move a lot slower. So the way they, the way they move through the world is a very different concept of time. What about the hair? They move much faster. It's more. It's closer to the way we think about time. Well, maybe physics and uh, music are the things that set us apart in different ways from animals. But uh, in any case, it's good to see you. We'll see you in the next one. Yeah.